here today as we call the state board meeting for Friday the 10th, 2020 to order, sorry. If you will, please stand while we say the pledge. Have children or no uh, uh, kids who are like in Boy Scouts or, or Girl Scouts or whatever, we would love to, you know, have a child, a student come in and lead the pledge. Uh, I just, all of my little people are now big people, so I don't have any way of having that to happen. Okay, uh, are there any changes to the agenda? None, and you all have the handout from Dr. Pepper for her report later. And the commissioner passed out the uh, redrawn attendance zones for the high schools for Little Rock School District, so we have all of that. Uh, we'll start with reports, a comprehensive semester report. And I, I may be on the wrong thing here, so yes, Ms. Jakes, come, come on up. <laughs> You're up to date and I'm not. Okay. Make sure I've got it right. Okay, good morning. Melissa Jacks, Educator Licensure. And I'm here today to go over the semester report for the licensure exceptions. Um, and we'll just start. This will be fall of 2019 that we're basically talking about today. Um, and we can issue these licensure exceptions according to Arkansas Code, annotated 615-1004. That allows us to do that. We're going to talk about ALPs, long-term subs, emergency teaching permits, Act 1240 licensure waivers, and effective teacher licensure exceptions. Okay, this is the year-to-year. -year on additional licensure plans and as you will see the additional licensure plans have gone down year to year by semester it's up a little bit when you compare 2018-19 school year to 2019-20 school year um, but not a lot and I think I would attribute that to our new um, standards for accreditation system doing a good job and that our school districts are doing a better job getting them in um, in a timely manner. Um, I don't think that they're, they're up any um, when we talk about true ALPs and where they should be. I, I think it's about like it was last year. Um, and we are on a downward trend for ALPs. Would you consider that a good thing or a troubling thing? Um, personally, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's an opinion. Right. ALPs, as you know, are people who are already licensed who are just getting licensed in another area. And um, so um, I, I do, you will see that the others are going up. So I'll let you make that conclusion on your own, <laughs> whether that's a good or bad thing. <laughs> so do you think it's because when we're doing the 1240s, we're letting people that maybe have content knowledge into the classroom yes, and, and then come in with the teacher certification later. So they already have the content knowledge where these, these have the teaching pedagogy, but are gaining the content knowledge. I think so. so we're, we're trading one for the other. Yes, ma'am. So I don't know, you know which way is better. But, Hard to but, say whether it's good or bad. Yeah. yeah. And so when you look at the districts, I did the percentage, um, and the actual ALP numbers come from ALs, okay? So those are the actual numbers. The number of teachers in a district I have to get from um, my school info, okay? And then I do the percentage. And so when you look at, these are all small school districts. So percentage-wise, you know, uh, if you're Harmony Grove and you have six ALP teachers and the number of teachers in the district is 15, that makes it 40. I'm not 
not sure that Harmony Grove only has 15 teachers, um, but that's what came out, you know, what was reported, self-reported from the school district. Um, but those are all small school districts. Uh, and if you look at these, none of these, um, well, they do, uh, I think Lead Hill has a, a waiver of licensure for some things, but. Um, okay, on long-term subs, um, there's the year-to-year -year comparison. And then if we look at uh, fall to fall, um, we had, it has gone up some. We had 288 unique positions requiring a long-term sub in 1819. And in 1920, we had 391. This, this could also, that's, that's a little bigger jump. It, some of it could be attributed to um, us doing a better job in the data and with the SFA system but it does look like we're using more long-term subs um, the fall of this year. We'll see how that plays out at the end of the year. I think that's a better number when we see the year, yearly total. Um, and 153 began the year as a long-term sub without a teacher of record, which was a two true vacancy last year. This year, 192 began with, as a true vacancy. Now that doesn't mean that during the year they may not find somebody or that you know they didn't want to hire, um, you'll see later the emergency teaching permits, well, maybe they didn't want to hire somebody permanently in hopes that they will find somebody. So you know we give districts the, the leeway to do what they, what they want um, and in hiring. Uh, so when you look at the percentages by school district, these are the school districts, um, and then of long-term subs, the highest to the lowest on the top 10, and how they play out. Yes, ma'am? Ms. Jackson, this is a broader question. Maybe I should save it for the end, but it, you, something you just said. Do we have uh, in our possession, or could we create as part of a periodic report, some stacked bar chart that looks at what are the number of teachers that we need every year. And this, and I'm going macro, and all the stories are at the local level, but understand total need and the mix and the way the mix has changed over the past, say, three to five years in terms of substitutes. And so where are our teachers coming from and so we can see a trend line? Um, I know that Frank Servideo in Educator Effectiveness does some, um, some data on that. Um, to get specifically, we can we can try to get more and get more specific um, than he does at this point. Um, um, Ms. Saracini, um, we'll certainly start working on that with Frank and uh, try to get you as much um, close as you want um, to that. Would you like it you'll by? Have to, you'll have to say your name. Sorry, Carly Saracini. Um, would you like it by? coming out of what programs the number and then look at attrition, what's leaving, what's retiring, so that you can kind of look at those numbers and then at the same time look at, uh, that may be a better comparison of what we're producing versus what's leaving right. the profession through retirement or other factors. It's a, it's a great point to use your judgment, but if the thing we're trying to better understand is what's the need and how are we meeting the need? And is that increasingly improving the quality of what our students are exposed to? That would be really helpful. And we can probably even break it down, uh, especially in those shortage areas, how many were that are coming out of the program for math, special ed, that may help look at that. And we, can, and we do have that data and we can get that for you. Great, thank you. <laughs> And you can just send it and it alert it to us in an email and then we can look at it on the computer. It, it, you don't have to bring it back before the board unless you choose to, which would be fine. Okay. And so on the effective teacher licensure exceptions, those went down a bit this year. Um, I do think that a lot of schools, this came from my school info, um, but I do think that most schools, I'm, I'm trying to get the word out with that. Um, we're going to the... Um, administrators conference, we're going speaking to ARC ASPA on how you can use this. Remember the effective teacher licensure 
exception is for that effective teacher that may be, let's say I'm licensed in English 712 and uh, I have a, there's a sixth grade English open opening and they, they want me to go down and teach just sixth grade, um, they could actually do that with this licensure exception. Um, and so I, I don't know how well this is being used or how often, but um, so far 98 school districts um, have used that this year. The emergency teaching permits um, in 1819, um, there were 284 approved so far, and 1920, this, 342. So they are catching on to that. They are using that. The number has gone up. We want them to use them for true vacancies, really. Um, on the emergency teaching permit, uh, you do have to be AQT in order to get the emergency teaching permit if it's in a core er teaching area. Uh, so we, we do want them to use that, but we are tightening up those rules on that a little bit too. In our new rules, you know, that um, have not um, passed yet, but that are, have been proposed, we have added um, to that for the emergency teaching permit that to require some experience. Okay, that you be have experience in the area. And elementary ed was the most requested of those. So when you look at emergency teaching permits, um, just for this fall, that by percentage wise, these are the school districts and their numbers and um, from highest to lowest on the top 10, of who's using these emergency teaching permits. Are, are, we, are we thinking about when a district is coming up on multiple lists? They're coming up on top 10 long-term subs, they're coming up on top We're 10. We're really comparing base. that and looking at that. Uh, and maybe mm -hmm. thinking about how they may need some extra support mm -hmm. in yes, uh, recruitment. And I'm, I'm going to uh, talk my last two slides. I'm going to talk about what some things in our office okay. of what we're doing um, as we're seeing these trends and what we're doing to help and what we've done so far. And Ms. Saraceni may have some ideas of what her plans for our unit will be. Okay. And 91 districts throughout the state use the emergency teaching permit this fall. Okay, so on Act 1240 waivers, those don't come out of my office. So I take this, took this information from my school info, um, but it looks like um, the fall so far in 1920, 671 were reported in 61 districts. Okay. And percentage-wise, by district, here would be uh, the numbers that we took from my school info. Who's using the most um, of that top 10. Okay, so here are the numbers. I'll get you on the licensure exceptions and waivers that we have total for the year so far. And what are we doing to ensure the data is reported correctly? So um, when we do the ALPs, the long-term subs, the emergency teaching permits, things that we, we're doing in our office. Okay, so we're, all, we're sending that list also to public school accountability to their office so they can, we can check for discrepancies between this, the SFA system, so what school districts are reporting and what we're actually getting. And so we're checking for discrepancies and when we see discrepancies, our team is working together to get those cleared up and try to make sure that our data is correct. Um, and so we'll do that throughout the year. Um, the long-term subs and the emergency teaching permits the data fields for that, um, that's a project that um, is being added to ALS, okay? So that data will soon 
I said by the end of the 1920 school year, but I just talked to the programmer yesterday, Ms. Saracini and I did, and he's, he's almost got that project complete. So I really think that you know, by in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have it, and maybe you, you guys would be able to see it when you um, pull up ALs, you know. So can you, is the 1240 language, are they in there also? They are not, because in licensure, we don't get those. Mm -hmm. I, I would think they would need to be included when you're, when you're thinking about these things with districts, because, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a, a teacher without the pedagogy, so they're, they're also not the, I know it's, it's the best we can do, but you know we've got some work to do. Right, and that's where we have to work with Public School Accountability and their team on the Act 1240 waivers, and um, we do get we do um, work with the co-ops, and so that those recruitment and retention people at the co-ops know in in their schools who these Act 1240 teachers are, so they're working with them. So our unit as a whole has dedicated some positions and we're starting to work with them on a path to licensure and to make sure we're keeping on top of that. Um, but the actual who they are is in SFA, not yeah. in the standards for accreditation system. It looks like and in it, my school info, it's not in ALS. Yeah. It looks like it, it, there may be some duplication. You may be counting the same teacher twice because they, well, it's a 1240 teacher, but she's this also, or he. So uh, I don't know if, if the opportunity is there for duplication, but y'all will find out, I'm sure, when you talk with them. Because you don't get names, right? You just get we don't. numbers, no. right? No, I don't. I right. can only see numbers from right. my school info right. of how many they have. I, you know, I really think district. that would be a piece of data that, that you need. I, I really think you need the names, and that way you can look mm -hmm. and, and see, you know, is there overlap? It, it, you know, I, the more the more data you get and the better data you get, mm -hmm. the better decisions you're going to be able to make. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Miss uh -huh. Salas Ford, there wouldn't be any problem with us have them having names, would there? No. Okay, thank you. And so the supports that we're providing, um, so within educator effectiveness, um, we now have a recruitment and retention um, team there where you guys knew Jeff Dyer, okay? So when, when Jeff left, really two people have been dedicated to this, um, to do some work in that. And one of those persons is Miss Venus Torrance, who was a licensure advisor in my office. So she knows licensure backwards and forwards. And so Venus is going to work with those alternate route educators. And so she is working with, uh, will be working, excuse me, with those 1240 teachers and anyone else, post the post-secondary people who already have a degree that are working on getting into a, a route to licensure. So that her, she has been dedicated to do that. And so that's one, one effort that we're making um, to make sure that these people are getting more support um, we're also working through the recruitment and retention facilitators at the co-ops uh, to support the teachers for the licensure exceptions. And uh, those are the people they do know within their districts that they work in each co-op. They know the names of the people and they are working with them, those recruitment. But they're getting them from the districts. They're going to the districts and, and getting all of the 1240 teachers and they're, li and they're looking at the licensure exceptions and they're working with each teacher. But um, you know, in certain uh, co-ops, you know, the need is, is bigger. And so uh, they're really um, working hard. But they're working with them on praxis supports um, for testing, um, not just praxis, but maybe the um, science of the foundations of reading exam, whatever's needed. You know, that co-op is working on um, in small groups and helping those teachers. And I do have some success stories. Um, that uh, I would love to talk to you about sometimes of you know some teachers that have worked um, and worked hard and gotten with study groups and been going to the co-op and working with these uh, retention and recruitment coordinators and uh, have been successful and gotten into a program and so I'm, I'm really proud of some. Um, we're giving test fee reimbursements for those um, P 
people who are adding areas to their license, that it, if it's a chronically critical shortage area, we'll, we'll reimburse them for that test, our office will. And so um, that's been pretty successful. Um, we're trying to get the word out more about that. Um, you know, so some programs, uh, Library Media was the one that um, did a really good job of th those, those people knew. And so I think I contribute that to the university programs, <laughs> knowing and letting them know. Um, but we're trying to get the word out on those test fee reimbursements because that, that, can be, that can be a hindrance for some especially when you've got uh, several te exams you need to take. Okay, any questions? No, I'd just like to request mm -hmm. that my, my button is send us your report. Okay. By email. Okay. Yeah, it'd be great to have Would that. you like me to send it to Ms. Zook and let her distribute it? I can't. Okay. <laughs> send, send it to, to Gina. Gina. She can. Okay, <laughs> great. Mean, that'd be great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, is there a second? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Okay, State Board, uh, our Teacher of the Year isn't here today, so we don't have anything there. Uh, to start on this other end, Dr. Moore, do you have anything to report uh, with regard to uh, pre-K? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Williams, Ms. Mc, Ms. McPetrick, okay. Anybody got anything you want to bring? Uh, Wita, I know you have some stuff. Uh, anybody else before I get to her? Okay, Ms. Newton? Um, I, I don't have anything on my normal things that I talk about, but you know, we we uh, have focused on literacy and, and rightly so, and I'm very uh, proud of the work that we've done in literacy. But uh, as a STEM and math person, I have some <laughs> what I think is exciting news. Uh, uh, I've been asked to to work with a couple of initiatives that uh, we're doing. Uh, one of them is uh, going to. Uh, create a uh, Arkansas STEM model program state advisory committee and they're going to do work to create a model to um, have uh, connect STEM to careers and career training opportunities to the appropriate part of the state economy and student needs so it's going to be a guide for educators schools and districts so that's one model that's going to be started and, and our first meeting of that is in February and then another one is the Arkansas Math Quest Family Engagement Co Coalition, and it's a collabor collaborative group to support students, parents, schools, and districts to um, have better critical thinking, problem solving, and reasoning. And so the goal is to develop activities centered around uh, understanding and mathematics for schools to use with stakeholders. So, and the first meeting in that is January 21st. So two initiatives in, in the STEM area. So. I'm excited. I'm sure you are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, Miss Dean? Sorry, I just stuck a pad over you. We had um, a very good community and family engagement meeting last week, last month. Um, and I've been doing some community visits with different schools. Um, Mr. Reggie Ballard and I visited. Uh, Cloverdale Middle School and um, got to speak with their administrators and tour the school and just find out what their needs were as far as um, what they needed with the school and, and community partnerships and and learn more about the par community partnerships that they already have with um, their stakeholders um, and we also visited Meadowcliff Elementary and um, visited with the administrator there and, and toured and an opportunity to learn more about their um, um, courses that they hold with their parents, oh. uh, which was really good. Um, so they're doing some really good things there and, and learned about some interesting partnerships that they have for their children there. They have a partnership with um, an equestrian um, group where the kids can go and learn about horseback riding and how to take care of animals. Um, but they, they had some really good, um, unique uh, community partnerships. So also wanted to learn about their, um, their needs and what we could do to help them. And I also plan to start highlighting um, different and unique stakeholder and community um, partnerships with different schools. So every month I'll try to bring someone Best in. Best practices. Yes, yes. Right. So we've been, we've been able to 
learned of some great new partnerships. So yeah, it was very good. good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Kaufman couldn't be here today, but she did mention to me yesterday that uh, we are ahead of schedule on uh, the information that will be provided. I think some, a lot of it comes out in April, and I think it's going to be out maybe in parts of January or latter part. But anyway, earlier is, is better for uh, planning and, and different things. And then uh, on the special ed front, uh, the feds, the federal government, the Department of Education at the federal level, uh, uh, set 1% in special education of students who could take a, an alternative test as opposed to ACT Aspire, okay? If a state exceeds that, then they have to work with them and special ed unit will go visit in those districts and find out if in fact, you know, do we have a higher percentage? Because when it comes to any group, when you try to group them, uh, you know, you may have an average of 1%, but you don't always have an absolute with 1%. So uh, they're just wanting to, to check to be sure are you counting the right kids? Do you really need these? Are you letting someone take the test that doesn't really qualify? Anyway, so they're really working a lot right now on that. Anything else from anyone? Okay, Commissioner. Well, uh, report card was on my list, so okay, good. Um, I'll, I'll you give probably a will say it better than I. Information. No, you you uh, definitely reported the essence of um, as part of our effort. Of continuous improvement, uh, early the earlier the better, uh, as Ms. Zook said. Uh, so we're going to be three months ahead of time uh, on most of the aspects of the report card. Now that what we have developed the state report card to do is to be rolled out uh, in modules, and so there will be some modules that may not have all the data, all, have all the information, uh, just because of timing of when it becomes available. But the uh, as it uh, becomes available, it will be rolled in to the, its respective module. But for the most part, most of the data that we typically wait until April 15th or sometime in April, uh, that's our uh, statutory deadline to report, is going to be reported in the coming days, uh, possibly as early as next week. Uh, so I think uh, I just want to uh, give compliments to the team here at the department uh, compliments to uh, the districts who have been working very hard over the last several years as we have worked with them to improve their data systems, their reporting, uh, data uh, accuracy, and all of that now uh, can be reported at an earlier time. Again, so planning can be uh, engaged in planning and, and working in the conversations uh, to make sure that they're meeting the needs of all their students. Uh, just this morning, uh, as far as pre-K, uh, Dr. Moore, I learned of a new legislative caucus that is, has been formed, the Early Childhood Well-Being Caucus. And uh, earlier, this, this, uh, about 10 minutes ago, I asked Aaron Franks, uh, our Director of Legislative Services, to identify, get more information for us on that. So that may be something of interest to you all. And we'll make sure as we get that uh, available, we'll send it to you. I do know that they have a meeting scheduled for January 16th at 10 o'clock. This is a legislative, uh, a, 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 it's described as a bipartisan legislative caucus uh, with the intent of um, looking at developing a legislative agenda for the 2021 session. So I know that there'll be topics that we will all be interested in knowing about and maybe having input in. Uh, you may get some calls uh, or emails concerning meetings that are going on around the state regarding uh, school district maps. Uh, so Arkansas GIS is working uh, to align school district maps, state maps, local maps for the purpose uh, in preparation for the census. Uh, so Arkansas GIS, has, they are the experts in this and they are taking the various maps that have been uh, adopted through the years, released by different public bodies, and they're trying to coordinate that and align that so that 
all the maps are the same. Right now, that is not the case. As a matter of fact, uh, there's an upcoming meeting regarding Pulaski County and Little Rock School District maps. It has nothing to do with any of the maps we've been talking about, so mm -hmm. I'll make sure that's clear. This is simply in preparation for the census. Uh, if you get any calls about that and you need more information, uh, please reach out to us. I know Courtney Silas Ford has been uh, very, and Lori Freno have both been very involved in that. I think Courtney has been more involved. She knows more about GIS now than she <laughs> did six months ago. So uh, just want to, that to be on your radar. And then the last, uh, well, next to last thing, Ms. Zook mentioned the this is just a follow-up of the zone high school attendance zone maps. This is based on prior action, and uh, they just developed the maps and released those on their website, so I wanted you to have a copy of that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about leads into Dr. Pfeffer's presentation. Yesterday, Dr. Pfeffer, Dr. Hernandez, and I, uh, before State Board, we went to the AAEA Aspiring Superintendents uh, session that they had, and they've been doing this for some time now, but you know, one of the things we recognize, uh, and I think you as board members especially recognize, is we have a need to develop school leaders and district leaders in the state. Uh, we see, uh, we've seen over the last five to 10 years, a number of retirements, uh, some very close to home, right, <laughs> Ms. Newton? Um, retirements of, of our superintendents, retirements of very well experienced principals, um, but the, the aspiring superintendent program is one that AAEA has established to look to meet that need, to develop leaders, to step in, um, and we really, we didn't get to stay for a lot of it, but the messages we were hearing yesterday were the messages I think we would all support. Um, one is, if you want to be a superintendent, you may be consider going to a rural small district that needs leadership uh, because that's that is a good place because you get the experience as as the superintendent uh, as a curriculum coordinator as a federal programs coordinator as a head janitor you get everything and uh, those are really the experiences that, that uh, become helpful uh, they also talked about the things we've been talking about they, they were talking about professional learning communities and the importance of that uh, they were talking about the importance of leading your district, uh, your board, through an, an analysis and discussion of student data. And um, so I was very proud of, of what I saw there. And um, they've, they've also, AAEA has also been a uh, very good partner with us as we have worked to change and improve the beginning administrator program. Uh, so uh, just know that there's a lot of work in these areas that uh, we're, when we see deficits of leadership in regions, you know, we recognize that, our partners recognize that, and we're working hard uh, to develop the talent to be able to step into those roles. Uh, with that, that is the end of my presentation, and uh, just as I said, to lead into what Dr. Pfeiffer was going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, just, just a second, Ms. Dr. Pfeiffer. Uh, okay, this is sort of off topic, but maybe not. Uh, I know that I hear that districts use uh, former NSLA money, now ESA money, to supplement the uh, the money they use on pre-K. And I guess I'm a little confused about how they can do that since the legislation is funding K-12 and closing the gap and all of that. So how is it that they can use ESA money uh, to supplement pre-K? Okay, no, that's a great question. So uh, when the NSL categorical was established, it, one of the uh, allowable uses and one of the preferred uses, in fact, was uh, depending on you know, the, the need in the district, that pre-K was an allowable expense for that. Uh, with, you know, if you go back to Lakeview and, and you read a lot of the arguments and the filings, there was an effort at that point to make pre-K part of adequacy. Uh, the court in the final ruling said, well, pre-K is not, you know, that, that's not what we're talking about. That's, there's no constitutional guarantee of pre-K, but if the state and localities want to do that, we recognize that it is an important part of moving forward on education. It just was not part of adequacy. 
Uh, so what I think we've seen in the last few years is uh, for some districts, the, a lot of their uh, NSL or ESA money going to pre-K um, because in 2017, legislature adopted a, a matching program so that if you spend your dollars on the three main categories that where uh, research and evidence shows it has the greatest impact, it was pre-K, it was tutoring, and it was uh, out of school programs. Um, when you look at the effect size of those three programs versus the effect size of a number of the other allowable uses, it's definitely in those three categories that you get the biggest bang for the buck. And so that's why um, you see a lot of those ESA funds going into okay. pre-K. That, that explains it. And it supplements the ABC because of the ABC being tied to uh, qualification you have to qualify uh, for those services. ESA then allows you, allows districts to maybe extend those, um, extend the eligibility or extend the offering of pre-K even to students that may not fit into those income, those family income ranges. So. Okay, and also I wanted to mention uh, uh, on, with regard to stakeholder, mm -hmm. um, uh, a conversation sort of started in one of the districts in the state when the state chamber in Arkansas Learns went to do their door-to-door -door things, and that sort of motivated the business community there to, and the other stakeholders to say, well, we need to be more aware, we need to get involved, and so now they're meeting uh, with the superintendent, with individual, they can't meet with the board, but they meet individually with the different board members so they can say, here we are, what can we do? Uh, this district was a no choice district and now they're participating in choice. So thanks to you and your work and the state chamber in Arkansas Learns getting all that, you know, we're all headed in the right direction and getting the right, in front of the right people is sometimes all it takes. So uh, we thank them for that. Okay, now Dr. Pepper. Hey, good morning, Ivy Pfeffer with the division. And um, I just wanted to do an um, update for you on the work of the Leadership Coordinating Council. So um, the council was established by statute and um, with the goal of um, looking at all of the different um, efforts, systems, initiatives um, surrounding school leadership and looking to really create an aligned system of collective leadership that expands all the way through the, the K-12 education system into post-secondary and workforce opportunities. And um, in, if you go back to, to the statute, one of the key things there is um, type of leadership that is um, based on evidence-based strategies and the type of leadership that will ultimately lead to student success. So um, I um, have had the privilege over the last um, year to um, be very involved with the Leadership Coordinating Council. Um, I gave you a copy of the members and um, the membership has, <coughs> I think, changed a little bit over um, the last um, few years, but um, in a large part, the, you've had a lot of the members on there that have been very consistent um, with the, the positions that they hold. Um, but over the last year, as we came together, we, we really began with going back to that original mission and vision that the Leadership Coordinating Council established um, several years ago. And um, I actually, when, um, when, I, when we began and I took over as chair, I started talking to them about what should a vision and mission really be for going forward. And as we um, spent the first meeting kind of going through ideas, um, towards the end, Dr. Gunner, um, I kind of, I think I was a little bit embarrassed because she said, you know, we had a vision and mission when we first started. Maybe we ought to start by reviewing that to see if that vision and mission is still relevant to the work we're doing today. So as we actually brought that out, started looking and looking at the list we had compiled and looking at what had been established, we really realized that um, the, the vision only <coughs> needed to be slightly tweaked and um, that the mission that the council would coordinate and recommend a state leadership development system for public education in Arkansas really was the same work that needed to continue. So um, 
what we did then is um, we, we really talked about what were the things that we needed to focus on because when you think about um, leadership within um, our education system, um, you all know we've been doing a lot of work recently with teacher leadership and really providing opportunities for teachers to be leaders, lead from the classroom without leaving the classroom. But in doing that and recognizing um, teacher leaders, really helping schools to understand what are different ways that you need to utilize your accomplished teachers, your um, lead teachers. So we started, um, started looking at that, but then also really realizing that um, principles really are um, um, so key to the leadership and whether or not those things are successful in schools. So for this 1920 school year, the council really has focused on principle and the development of principles. And when you kind of think about where things are situated in a continuum of leadership, you have your teachers, your teacher leaders, you've got your, your building principles, and you've got your superintendents, and it really takes both teachers and superintendents um, when you look at where principals are situated, they're working at working with both levels. Principals need the support from um, central office leaders um, because they are not only growing and developing in their own um, career, but they're working with teachers to help support and develop teachers. So if you look at, and Dan, I think if you'll scroll down a couple of pages, one of the things that, um, it's on the on top of page three on this document that I gave you. Um, <coughs> go on down a little bit, yeah, top of page three, we, we kind of went back and, and looked at some collective commitments that we wanted to focus on and we wanted to ensure were in place um, as we prepare, develop, and support principles. So we realize that it's important that at all levels we are uh, preparing, supporting, and developing principals who will create, organize, and, um, and manage a safe and secure learning environment. So those who can cultivate leadership in others, have a success, uh, help shape a vision of academic success, maximize talent of people, um, use data and organize processes to f facilitate continuous improvement, and also take responsibility for the success of every learner in our schools. <coughs> so in doing that, and so now, Dan, if you'll go back to page two, sorry, I'm kind of jumping back and forth. Um, I want us to focus on this um, visual here. And what we did is we really kind of started looking at when we think about principals from the beginning through their career, what does a, like a career trajectory really look like? And um, so you can see here, um, you start with um, leadership preparation. And you um, see that we have on that um, trajectory realigned leadership preparation. And we have realigned leadership preparation because right now what our um, principal, um, our school leader preparation programs are doing, they, they're having to update the standards and the content of their programs. They're having to go um, to, to, and those are being submitted now. And the way those programs are gonna be reviewed is gonna be different than in the past. We're gonna have several practitioners on the review <laughs> of those leadership preparation programs because what we need to make sure is that we are really closing the gap between preparation and practice for our school leaders. Um, the programs now will have to have um, entry criteria that it, rigorous program entry criteria. So in the past, I think, Different programs had had different levels of criteria for, um, for those to enter the programs. What we're really looking for now, will our leadership preparation programs um, be really looking for candidates who demonstrate that they're ready to take this next level of leadership? I think one of the great things that because of the work we're doing with teachers and teacher leadership development, we want people to understand that entering a building leadership um, preparation program is what you need to do if you're interested in going that route and pursuing that route. But it's not something you have to do just to get a master's degree and get a bump on the pay scale. And so by, by having all of these things coordinated and aligned, um, I think what it's going to do is enable these realigned leadership preparation programs to really focus on are we preparing um, 
the, those who are entering these programs to really be successful building level leaders? Do they have the interest and the dispositions that they're going to enjoy this experience? They're going to enjoy this learning opportunity. And is it ultimately then going to provide them with the relevant internship opportunities while they're gaining their, um, while they're able to complete their program? And um, then once they become a school administrator, we want to make sure that our beginning administrator um, mentoring program really is situated to meet their needs. And so in um, that area, that's where I think over the last three years now maybe, this I think is our th third year, to work with the um, Arkansas Association of um, Educational Administrators um, with that beginning administrator program. And what we're able to do there is tap into the talent. So we at the department and at AAEA are trying to do what these collective commitments are saying we're doing. Um, we're going to maximize the talent of our currently practicing administrators. And working with AAEA, we've been able to provide the type of mentoring to an elementary school principal from another elementary school principal. <coughs> and they're able to work together in small cohorts. So you might have three or four elementary school principals <coughs> who um, have an advisor who's, an, who's a strong elementary school principal. And they are um, having monthly webinars. They are um, able to um, get together at convenings um, during the year. And so it's really becoming much more effective than if in the past how we did mentoring was if you're in a district, an administrator in that district has to mentor you. Well, if we have a new elementary um, principal and all you have is a high school principal and a superintendent, that elementary school principal may not get the same kind of mentoring experiences because high school administration is very different from elementary school administration. So this is really providing a much um, better foundation and it also is an opportunity for them to have support for up to three years. So we're, if you're looking at that trajectory, what we're trying to think of is let's, let's lengthen these experiences out. Um, and then you look at the next um, item there, the leadership quest. Um, we've talked to you a little bit about this um, program of professional development for principals that we've had in place now um, for the past four years. Um, that was actually begun um, through a grant opportunity with SREB. And um, once the grant period ended, then we were able to extend that um, working with um, Dr. Hernandez and the Office of Coordinated Support and Service. Um, but what we actually have are, um, it, it's really built like a multi-tier system of support. If you think of the RTI pyramid, that first tier is just general support for all principals that they have an opportunity to participate in in a collaborative meeting at their co-ops. The level two is for any principal that finds any area where they may be struggling. So you may have a principal that um, um, is, is kind of struggling with um, getting through all of the um, RISE assessor trainings or has gone through the RISE assessor trainings but they just don't feel comfortable um, going in and really assessing the proficiency. So we have um, um, folks through Dr. Hernandez's office, we have Rocky Malone and Brent Miller that can go in. They're going to pick up the phone and call Jennifer Barbary and um, some of um, our RISE team to help go in and, you know, how do I help this principal? How do we make sure they're getting the support they need? And, and once that principal is feeling comfortable, then that tier two support's no longer needed and um, they're able just to benefit from that regular mm -hmm. interaction. And then we have in a tier three, that's where um, OCSS really comes in when they're gonna have to go in and sit down side by side mm -hmm. with someone for a while to work on some more intense things. Um, the last step on that leadership trajectory is the master principle. And um, we, um, that's currently run by um, the Leadership Academy. It's been in existence for some time now. And um, when we look at all of these things and think about them as far as a trajectory, um, prior to this year with the Coordinating Council kind of putting this together, I don't think any of these things were really thought of in, in terms of the start all the way through the finish and what could that really look like. So our continuing conversations are really around how do we 
take each of these steps and really make sure that there's this interconnected and that our school leaders see this as a pathway for them. And what I would like to continue and I think could help continue the conversation is even go in between some of those stops along the way and think about beginning administrator mentoring. And once you've finished maybe three years of having that mentoring experience, and we, went, we don't want mentoring to be looked at as something I have to do. We want mentoring to be looked at the opportunity for the support that I need to help me get through my first three years so that I really have my feet underneath me and I really have um, those foundational skills that I need. And so something we could consider, kind of like we've done with teachers, we could consider um, after um, three years as a beginning administrator, that may be where you have that career um, administrator designation put on your license. Um, and then that's where the leadership quest really comes in because now as this career administrator, you want to keep getting, um, you want to keep having learning experiences that are going to take you at, to that next level, help you focus, help you decide, you know, do I want to go on and um, work on a specialist degree? Do I want to work on a doctorate in a certain area? Do I want, um, um, going through this leadership quest experience, if we can create kind of a culminating experience for them, that may be that they get under a lead principal or a lead administrator designation on their license. And then again, as a superintendent in a school district, what would I do if I have a lead principal? Well, maybe your lead principal becomes um, a facilitator of learning for all your principals, or maybe a lead principal not only oversees a um, elementary building, maybe that lead principal starts looking at being a principal over multiple um, buildings within a district and is growing that next level of leadership underneath them. So I think all of this is just really about thinking through next level leadership and what are some opportunities that we can do to really get people thinking intentionally so that if a principal aspires to go through the master principal program and be designated as a master principal, you've really got a high performing individual who has demonstrated success before they ever even enter the master principal program. And then that could become a culminating experience for our building level leaders. So I think it's twofold, creating the vision, creating the opportunities, and then getting our schools to really think strategically about this whole process. So um, that's the work that um, the, the council has been, been doing this year. We still have a lot of work to do because not only through this, but then you know also thinking about situating this between the other levels of um, leadership. How do we make sure that we don't um, lose any momentum with building the teacher leadership capacity and then um, the um, opportunities through enhancing our superintendent programs. So um, I'm going to pause there for a minute and see if you have questions about what I've talked Ms. about. I love the idea of the career principal and lead principal. Um, my question is on the, the learning quest. Are they still doing the modules as far as uh, going through and letting the principals do different modules of, of learning? Are they still doing that in the quest? Um, so it's, it's shifted a little bit. Um, I, I think for this next, there, there are different modules, yes. And co-ops um, should be able to customize that. Um, I think we've gotten a little bit away from the variety and the choice <coughs> at those co-op levels. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to go back to. Because I, I, I remember when we discussed it, I thought how, how great those mm -hmm. modules were, and I can see those becoming micro-credentials mm -hmm. in, in that uh, area that you're talking about. Because yeah. uh, it was a great program when, when you brought it before. So that's really what we want to do. and. Um, we're going to, um, our plan is, um, Andy Sullivan um, and I have been doing quite a bit of conversation um, around that, going back to what we started with, with the tiers mm -hmm. of support and having, and, and we, we want to tie it to these collective commitments as well. So when we're talking about the different types of modules, the, the commitment on effective use of data and mm -hmm. effective use of data systems. So if that is a component, like you said, you could design the learning experiences and have a micro-credential. Right. That feeds into um, use of eSchool, use mm -hmm. of um, um, the standards for accreditation tool, use of my school info. Right. You know, do we have people that really are using those systems mm -hmm. 
to make good decisions. You know, we even something um, that we take for granted that, you know, principals work on master schedules. The master schedule it's is a, a huge yes. component because yeah. if you're not aware of your effective teachers and their effectiveness mm -hmm. and you're building a master schedule, you're not doing good things for kids. When right. you're not being very intentional about that, um, you know, that's, um, that's just even a one small piece there that yeah. has a huge impact. So yeah, I could see I could see that just feeding right into what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. micro credentials are definitely part of our conversation and yeah. how we might get to a lead principal designation. Yeah. Good, thank you. Anybody else on this side? Anyone on this side? Okay, I had a, a, the things that I ran ran into uh, when getting with the new principal is they would have finished the master's program and perhaps y'all have had more influence and, and this has changed over time. <clears throat> but in the getting your master's administration, no one ever taught you how to conduct an interview. No one taught you what to look for when you're in a classroom uh, as far as if the quality of the lesson and then how to conduct the post uh, lesson observation with the teacher, and I know leads and tests is taking care of some of this. And then uh, to the stakeholder, how to work and communicate with parents and how to build relationships with your stakeholders. Is this something you all are having to do? Is this something that the masters and administration has now corrected? Uh, do you have insight into that? I would say it is being, it, this is what we are correcting, okay? There are some programs that are ahead of others, um, and I can't even tell you well, who is yeah. or isn't, you know, just um, standing here. But when you look at that, between the realigned preparation and the relevant internship opportunities, that is what we expect to see as those programs are reviewed and approved. Because what you talked about, to me, those are the internship opportunities there conducting interviews. So going back, and that's where the program has to have partnerships with their school districts. But if I know that, um, if I'm a principal or superintendent in a district, and I know I've got five people that are going through a preparation program, I need to be utilizing those folks when we conduct interviews so that they can learn that process, um, so that they can contribute to that. That's where giving them those relevant internship opportunities is so important, where you're demonstrating that you're actually doing that. Um, being part of evaluation conversations. TESS is set up right now to have peer <laughs> observations. They don't, they're not, um, you know, pr providing the data that's going to be part of a summative evaluation, but they're part of that growth and development opportunity. If I know I've got people in a leadership preparation program, I need to be sure that those are folks who are helping to do those peer observations with teachers, giving them that experience. I need to be sure that they're out there when we do our family and community engagement night so I can be watching them. Because in my mind, if I'm in a district, I need to be growing my own talent too. So I need to be watching as they're getting their preparation, are they getting those relevant opportunities for practice? <coughs> if it's only done through a written portfolio, that stuff can get made up. And um, you, if you're not actually having to do it, um, you're not doing the learning. So that's where we're talking about the, um, those opportunities. So I think the review of these programs is going to be so important. And um, I think that review process it's going to be collaborative. The, the program leaders are going to have to come in and talk to a panel, just like I'm talking to you, to say this is what our um, leadership preparation is looking like. Because the other part of that is there's oftentimes a huge gap in time between when someone finishes a preparation program, a master's preparation program, and when they might become a, a, a principal. And um, you know, if it's, you may have had great preparation, but if it's eight years before you actually are hired as a principal and you've not done anything, and so I think that's where, that's that value in how people are used, so. Okay, thank you very much. Great okay. presentation. Uh, is there any new business to come before the board? Uh, do we have any public comment? Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Miss Dean. Say goodbye, Dr. Hill. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Be safe going home in the rain.